Hello, and welcome to Differential Discussions. I'm Melissa. And I'm Dave. And today we're going to talk about red cell morphology. Today we're actually going to look at a really interesting uh, slide that I have that is a beta thal minor with hemoglobin E. So, so this is really <laughs> neat because th th now we have two genetic disorders kind of intersecting. Yeah. Um, and I think one might call this uh, a, a compound heterozygous yes. picture, right? Um, so what does that term mean? Yeah, so compound heterozygous. So heterozygous means that uh, if with the beta gene in particular, remember we have two beta genes, one from mom, one from dad. So with the beta genes, what you're going to have with your heterozygous is one gene is impacted. So when you're compound heterozygous, it means that one of your genes is impacted by one mutation and your other gene is impacted by a different mutation. So it's not homozygous because it's two different mutations, but it's compound heterozygosity because you have both genes impacted. And generally when you put beta thal minor and hemoglobin E by themselves. So if I'm a beta thal minor or I'm a hemoglobin E, and I'm just heterozygous for it, they're both relatively almost benign. Yeah, mild, right? Yeah, they're, very, yeah, they're relatively mild. I think uh, hemoglobin E is, is benign when it's just heterozygous, but beta thal minor is definitely going to be a mild thing. So when you put them together though, you get a, a clinical phenotype that's almost as severe as beta thal major. So the, the, whenever you're dealing with beta thal mixed with something like hemoglobin E or sickle cell disease, you're going to get like, or sickle cell trait, excuse me, because you'd be a compound heterozygous. They're going to be really severe syndromes that those patients experience. So this was a really cool slide where the patient has, it's compound heterozygous, beta thal minor and hemoglobin E. So this is the fun picture that you, you get when, when that happens. Yeah, so assessing morphology in a slide like this is actually kind of difficult. Yeah. You get a little bit of um, information saturation, maybe yeah. is a, a nice alliteration. To, <laughs> but, um, you know, I see a sphere site here, there's codocytes, uh, polychrome, lots of different morphology. Inclusions, too. Can never forget about our inclusion. Yeah, well, and let's, let's even, before we get to the red cells let's just talk about the nucleated cells in the field because we don't just have white cells now yeah true very true <laughs> so, so we have our neutrophil yeah there you go we have our normal lymph and then there's one fella in this field that's nucleated that doesn't look like the others yeah so, so here we've got an nrbc so he's a nucleated red Right. And you can see his, his cytoplasm looks very much like the same coloration as the mature erythrocytes around it. So we know that it's right at the stage, that orthochromic stage, where it's getting ready to spit out that nucleus. It just hasn't quite spit it out yet. And that's the most common NRBC that we're going to see whenever we have any sort of stress on the marrow and you got to really pump out red cells. We're going to see this type of nucleated red. And you're going to see a lot of them in this slide. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. All right. So outside of those guys now, right? Oh, actually, let's back up a second. So nucleated reds, you would count them as part of your white cell quantitative estimate if you were doing a white cell quantitative estimate. But if you're doing a diff, they're not part of the diff. You count the number of NRBCs per 100 white cells counted. So it's a separate tally or a clicker or a button, depending on how you're act actually counting it and what's available to you. But you have to count them separate from your 100 white cells. And the reason why clinically, when we express a white cell count to clinicians uh, to provide care, they're going to use that number as an inference to the immune system's capabilities generally, right? So nucleated red cells will have no immune function at all. <laughs> so uh, we really don't want, um, you know, it, I can imagine a situation where someone has a suppressed immune system and a low white count. And then if you reported out their nucleated red cells, you'd give a false impression of immunity. 
yeah and we, we don't want to do that so that that's that's the reason why we count them separate uh so now that we've talked about the the nrbc let's get to the morph so um, because this is a hemoglobinopathy, right? Both thalassemias are hemoglobinopathies. They're quantitative hemoglobinopathies. And then uh, hemoglobin E is actually a little bit of both quantitative and qualitative. So because we have both, um, and either one would be sufficient, but because we have both, we're definitely going to have codocytes. So codocytes are present in all, on all hemoglobinopathies. So we're going to see them, whether it's thals or sickle cells or any of the other qualitative or quantitative types of hemoglobinopathies. And so we're going to see them here, which we do. We see a lot of them. Yeah, and they vary a little bit too, huh? In their intensity, yeah. Yeah, because you've got some that are like this here, right? Where you can clearly see that it's a codocyte. And then you have some that are kind of like this, where you can't really see this almost center area of hemoglobin but it's just being kind of pushed over a little bit and so we can tell it's a codocyte it's just a little bit squashed in the area that you're finding it or you know this is an incomplete one where it's not a complete circle so th there's a lot of different cells in here that are true codocytes that just don't have that perfect target so a little off topic. Does that not look like the Mickey Mouse silhouette below that inside the codicil? Where? Right below this? that. Yeah. This? Oh, I see it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I got Disney on the brain. It's a Mickey Mouse site. <laughs> and then you have an absolutely gorgeous codocyte to the right of the one that you circled there, right? Yeah. And that one. Whoo, that's like textbook gorgeous. All right, all right. Uh, other than other than that, I know Dave, you mentioned the spherocyte earlier. So this guy here, and he's actually a microspherocyte. So spherocyte, Quite small. yeah. So spherocytes don't have to be microcytic, and if it's just a regular spherocyte, they're generally only just slightly smaller than the rest of the red cells, so they're not truly microcytic. But this guy is truly a microcytic spherocytic red cell. So you would call it a microspherocyte. I think he's the only one though. Yeah. Maybe him. It's for, yeah, maybe spherocyte there as well. Yeah. And, and then we get your borderline on the size a bit, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's definitely a spherocyte because there's no central pallor. But look at how concentrated this one's hemoglobin is versus that one. So this one is definitely a spherocyte, but this one is a microspherocyte. Mm -hmm. I would say that that one's MCHC, if you had the ability to evaluate, would be elevated. Very, very, very elevated, yes. I think, too, what I want to point out, because there's so many inclusions here, is just this is a platelet. This is a platelet. This is a platelet. Look at how many platelets we have on red cells now, right? So this guy yeah. here. Oh no, give me my little drawy guy back. Okay. This is a platelet. I'm on the hunt for the platelets now. Okay, so those are platelets and, and really look to see that, that little halo around them when they're pushed in the hemoglobin versus what we're seeing here, here, here. Right. So even between this one and this one, they're different inclusions, but you can see that they're sitting in the hemoglobin. There's no clearing around them. It's not like they're separate. It's, it's truly in the hemoglobin. So then I guess we can talk about the different types of inclusions briefly. Sure. Yeah, I think it's valuable. Definitely. So. Let me draw them for you. Again, my terrible drawing skills. <laughs> Do my best. All right. So there's three major types of uh, red cell inclusions. There are Howell Jolly bodies. I'm just going to write HJ. Right? Howell Jolly bodies. So Howell Jolly bodies are fragments of DNA, and they're going to be typically a, a dark, purpley blue kind of color. They share the same color as the NRBC nucleus, really. And there's usually only one per red cell. Occasionally there's two, but there typically is one. 
And this guy here looks like an HJ to me, where there's just that single dot present and he's all on his own, right? So that's an HJ right there, this little dot here. So that's what an, how a jolly body. The other thing are Pappenheimer bodies. So I'm just going to write Pap because I'm not trying to write Pappenheimer. <laughs> I want to see you write out the word Pap. <laughs> so Pap, that looks like Pop. It's Pap, right? So Pappenheimer. And Pappenheimer bodies are granules. They're iron granules. And typically your, your atlases and your textbooks will show you like the classic three in a pair like or in a triplet like this. But you, what the point is, is you're going to find them in singles, triples, doubles, spread across the cell, but not evenly. It's spread in little bunches and little groups. And you can see here, you've got one, two dots there, one dot there, and one dot there. So this erythrocyte has Pappenheimer bodies in it. And the color, it's very subtle, but the color is more blue, less purple, right? Yes. In, a, in a Pappenheimer. Yes. Yeah, good point. Yes. It, it, at least in right stain. Yes, yeah, which is typically where we dabble and hematology is in the right so definitely and then the third one i don't see in this field any but we're going to talk about it anyway so the other one is basophilic stippling so i'm going to write b a s because i'm going to write b s so b a s is basophilic stippling and what that is is it's rna that you find inside these cells but the thing about it is that it's evenly spread across the cell itself or relatively evenly right but the point is you right. have it spread all the way across the whole cell and it can be fine like i drew here which is much more common in thal or it could be coarse and thick granules which is much more common in lead poisoning and basically it's different can sometimes be pretty easy to miss too right especially uh, fine so one of the techniques i find myself doing as it developed is when I change fields, as soon as I enter a field, I'm oscillating the fine focus. I'm doing very, it now. Yep. And, and we're kind of, you're coming in and out, in and out on focus. And that really helps you capture some of these more subtle inclusions. Because you may have a field in focus and be able to see the cells relatively well. And sometimes things like basophilic sip, stippling, if you pull focus just a tad, they come into focus and you can see them clearly. Absolutely. Okay. And so showing you the difference between these inclusions here and these platelets here. All right. So let's clear all that out of the way. I, uh, then we have some uh, polychromasia. I just want to say this is the field that keeps on giving, right? We don't even have to look around much. And we're not even through all the morphology yet. <laughs> Yep, so we've got polychromasia, uh, which is just, again, those stress reticulocytes that are coming out. And then we have a schistocyte. We have a, a fragment, a cell fragment here. Mm -hmm. And so one of the problems with thalassemia is these unused globin chains, depending on, you know, what um, that we're talking about, they will damage, right, uh, the red cell membrane causing an increased fragility. You're gonna see more things like schistocytes. And, and, and that's really unsurprising, especially given how this field looks. You know, this, this patient probably has a lot more schistocytes that we're gonna see as we move around. Uh, I mean, I think we can mention that this one looks like an echinocyte. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's dual purpose, right? Codocyte, echinocyte. <laughs> So uh, an echinocyte, it's, it looks like echinocyte, it's echinocyte. And you, the way I think about this is think of a sea urchin, right? A, a, a sea urchin is in uh, the echinoderm family and echino, echinocyte. So it's like a sea urchin. So that's how I always think about it. I, I didn't know that. And it's always funny to see where the root of these things come from. That's cool. Yeah, that's how I always thought. But I, I used to love, I still do, but I used to be super big into 
marine biology. I think that's most of the females of my generation were huge into, into marine bio. And so I, I did a project on sea urchins. And so I always think of echinocytes, I think of sea urchins. So echinocytes are burr cells. Basically they have these little tiny spikes all the way around that are fairly even, right? And you're looking at these and you're like, well, some of them are a little bit bigger. Yeah, but relatively they're about the same size because when I'm talking about like different size spikes, I mean like me, like that kind of difference, not this subtle, small difference. It, I'm talking about a bigger difference. Big, diff, big differences in the spikes are more acanthocytes versus these that are uh, an echinocyte. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's one of the things the students will struggle with a little bit, right? What's an echinocyte? What's an acanthocyte? Um, an acanthocyte, you're looking at uneven projections yes. and uh, echinocyte, much more even projections. Yeah, I think I'm ready to and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, 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 we can, we can move. The other thing I would say too is acanthocytes tend to have extreme projections, like they're very long. Yes. Echinocytes tend to be shorter yeah and hopefully we'll see in a campsite so a lot more codocytes yep really nice codocytes too easy to pick out codocytes they're not as move up just a hair no wrong direction it's very difficult to stay oriented <laughs> Did I lose him? Oh, I think there's a little bit more. There he is. This is the guy I wanted. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So let's go back to codocytes before we talk about dude. So we have lots of really nice, easy to pick out codocytes. Okay. And then the reason why we came, I, I struggled with the microscope was so we could find him. This guy right here. Looks like uneven projections to me. Yeah. So nice, uneven projection. See how this is kind of like awkward flat space. And then all of a sudden you've got this big spike and then a medium spike and then more semi like flat space that might be a little bit bumpy and then nice, even projections. And then again, flat space and um, so it's, it's not even at all. And you have these abnormal projections. So that is an acanthocyte. Unfortunately, there's not really a good echinocyte in here to compare it to. So yeah, there's kind of a rough one, but I, I don't yeah, there's a few like him. semi like that are like a little bumpy on the edges, but no good ones really. Okay, but uh, let's actually let's take a second and compare it to like this schistocyte. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the schistocyte has uneven projections also. But it's, a it's the size, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the that's where the distinction really becomes like this is just so tiny. Whereas the acanthocyte is still a cell, right? Mm -hmm. Still a whole cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. I'll let me clear that. Um, we have another NRBC right here. Another NRBC. We've got another spherocyte here. We've got these like let's let's talk about like this guy here. Cause he doesn't he just looks like a blurb. <laughs> the distribution of hemoglobin in the cell is very irregular, right? It is. It's really, really irregular. It's 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 not it doesn't look like it's doing like it doesn't look like a codocyte. It just looks really odd. It probably was trying to be a codocyte, but did this. So some some places will call things like bizarre cells when they can't can't classify them. So that's something too that if your institution calls that, you have the option to use bizarre cell. That that is true. Like sometimes things defy an organization to the mm -hmm. classification, right? Yeah. Things don't read textbooks. Why not? I think the only other thing really is, uh, again, there's in inclusions in here, right? So we've got an inclusion in here. 
let's let's play with that fine tune a little bit so we can actually see. It looks like there's two dots there. So Pappenheimer bodies for that one. And then this one here, this looks like a Howell Jolly body. It looks like there's a Howell Jolly body right here as well. I wonder if that's two cells squashed together or one giant weird cell. Probably impossible to tell, honestly. Yeah, I can't tell, but there's definitely another Howell Jolly body right there. And I think they're HJs and not Paps just because of their size, really. And they do look like they're a darker coloration when you compare it to like these guys up here. Howell Jollies too tend to be neat, like uh, rounded, right? And then Pappenheimers tend to be a little bit rough. If the, if the Paps are concentrated sufficiently to kind of look like a Howell Jolly, mm. the, they'll, they'll still be gritty rough, um, but always the color is a good thing to fall back on. True, yeah, absolutely. All right, you say we go to the next field and see what else we can find? So here we can start right there. We've got two nucleated reds together. So, and then that one. So you can see we've seen more nucleated reds than white cells in, in this one. And, and talk about anisocytosis too. There's a codocyte above that looks like it could eat those nucleated reds. <laughs> so uh, just for clarification, aniso is the variation in size. And there's a huge variation in size in part because you have microcytic cells because both thal and hemoglobin e produce microcytic cells but also because there's such rapid cell death and turnover you have macrocytic cells you have retics you have and i'm sure this decreased mitotic division so that it can kick out those red cells a little bit quicker too with the level of anemia that this patient has so you have some cells that are really large and really small and then of course you have a lot of schistocytes the yep. RDW must be through the roof on this patient. Yeah, this this you, you might even approach a point where and, and most analyzers will be like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But so let's start. So there's there's a, a really nice just the site over here. That's it. Beautiful codocytes too. Yep, some really really nice target cells. Those codocytes in here. We have a lot of these bizarre looking hemoglobin cells where the hemoglobin isn't really nicely placed inside of the erythrocyte. It's sort of just thrown in. Um, there's some, there's a teardrop, a decryocyte. I say teardrop decryocyte. And uh, a spherocyte maybe perhaps too? Yeah. Uh, yep. So there's one here. It actually looks like this is a spherocyte as well. Yep. Not not micro spherocytes, but spherocytes. Hmm. Uh, and then I think there's just some inclusions. Yeah, definitely a lot of inclusions, and you know things like Pappenheimer bodies are going to be um, really apparent and around when there's lots of red cell death. So you got huge red cell turnover and you get a lot of these paps. And these paps are these little guys like here, here, here. Not that one, that's an HJ. There's like a little bunch of them here. So you can see just as you're kind of scanning, there's a whole bunch of these little uh, clusters of the Pappenheimers. There's a bunch of them, but let me pull up. There's a really nice Howard Galley body. Beautiful. Yeah, that's the classic Howell Jolly body that we're that we're gonna see. Because we they really do Howell Jollies really do tend to be not large, uh, but as far as inclusions go, they're t on average the largest inclusion. Absolutely, nice and chunky. Okay, let's find another another place for us to venture to. Oh, there's a white cell. Did I pull it in? No. There's a white cell. Hooray! I think that's like the second white cell we've seen. Yeah, neutrophils. Yeah. 
and just another really gross picture of red cell morph. So where you have Howell Jolly bodies, lots of Pappenheimer bodies all throughout, little chunk of them there. You have these spherocytes. This one's probably almost microcytic, right? And then even above that too, right? It's not a great shaped spherocyte, but yeah. 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 And then let's see, uh, lots of codocytes, obviously. Um, some polychromasia, right? This one's polychromatophilic, that one, that one. Um, there's an echinocyte here. So again, different than the acanthocyte and the schistocyte. And let's just point this out. There's a platelet. And notice this Pappenheimer body clump to this platelet. Yep. And we, do, we have the halo with the platelet and there's no halo with that inclusion. Let's play with that fine tune and see if we have any basophilic stippling. I'm not seeing any. Move on a little bit again. Sure. Smudge. Oh yeah, that is a smudge. Is he in there? Yeah. So that's just a smudge. He's not a real. He was a white cell, but we smooched him during the smear making, so now we ignore him. So this isn't in the bad field. <clears throat> so there's a schistocyte right here. Right? There's an echinocyte right here. So again, comparing, comparing with those two. Now, if only there was an acanthocyte also right here. <laughs> so what's weird too is like right and slightly up a field, there's a platelet on top of a square red cell. <laughs> yeah, so this is the platelet, right? And then you can see there's Pappenheimer bodies next to it too. He's crazy. Looking. That's, yeah, that's a crazy red cell. Gosh, and then there's a super nice Howell Jolly body right here. Actually, I wonder, is this an acanthocyte? Those are pretty irregular and they're pretty long. Yeah, I think that's fair. Erase this and then erase that. So look, we have a, a, an echinocyte here. We have a schistocyte here and we have an acanthocyte over here. Oh, look, I drew so... a with an uneven projection. <laughs> and so this warrants a screenshot, doesn't it? I mean. We love when these teaching moments just kind of fall in our lap. Excellent. And actually there's a schistocyte right next to here too. How cool. You can just see the differences in the projections and the size and the shape of the cells. And, and I hope our uh, newer students learning peripheral blood smears um, have normals fresh in their brain. And, and you can see this is significant red cell disease. Uh, mm. Yeah, it's ugly. It's beautiful. That's a science term, right? That's a yeah. <laughs> very scientific term, ugly. So see, just more of the same. So uh, Dave, if you were gonna quant, if you were gonna call this with our semi-quantitative methods, we might say that there's at least two plus codocytes present. Yeah, yeah, yep, absolutely. And part of this is gut feeling too, right? Because um, our fields aren't going to be perfectly aligned with the microscope field. Uh, They're a smidge smaller. But yeah, and, and I mean, I think we could probably call one plus just a site yep. by the looks of things. Um, our, our inclusions a lot of times are qualitative. I suppose it depends on the institution, right? But so for our standards, we would say that Howell Jolly bodies and Pappenheimer bodies are present. Yeah, uh, there might be enough to call. I don't know about acanthocytes, but but our echinocytes though, right? Echinocytes, yeah. I think there might be enough echinocytes to call. 
and you you could potentially call micro and macro here mm -hmm. yeah yeah right maybe one plus of each i don't know that there are enough spherocytes to call yeah that would be judgment call and we'd have to go to the numbers specifically they're definitely consistent in each field but i don't know if there's enough of them to call right so. And then uh, certainly a significant anisocytosis if that's a graded criteria. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Aniso and poik. Oh yeah. So we mentioned yeah. it also is a variation in size, and poikilocytosis is the variation in shape. So we definitely have both of those here. In spades, yeah. We got plenty of aniso and poik. Definitely. This is a great slide. This great is great slide. It's a good slide and it just shows you how you really have to go field to field to field and you can't just rely on you know one or two fields you really have to do all the fields and evaluate to see what's present consistently in enough numbers in every field to call so i think that's it for this one so thanks for watching yeah thank you Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you'd like notifications whenever we post a new video. And feel free to reach out to us on social media or via email with comments or suggestions about future content. Thanks.